My name is Shiri Cabral. I'm a senior database administrator slash architect at Mozilla. This talk is different MySQL forks for different folks. Um, as it says on the slide, the slides are up at bit.ly slash MySQL forks, and you can rate this talk at join.in slash 7920. So I'm going to talk about MySQL forks for different MySQL folks. So the first uh, question I'm going to answer is why do you choose software? And I'm going to go through all of these categories of why you choose software with all the different forks because you know, part of it is um, on technical merit, right? And so actually last night I was like, you know what? This presentation has a lot of words on it. It would be so much better as a mind map. So literally last night I was like, well, let me see if I can make this into a mind map. So I started like trying things and downloading software. And I realized that part of it was kind of like, you know, related to this talk. So part of it is technical merit. What's technical merit? It does what I need it to do. Hopefully it does it well or whatever, but basically, you know, you have some requirements, right? So my requirement for the mind mapping software was do doesn't show too much of the presentation at once. Um, and I also wanted each new thought to be revealed. As you see here, right, every new thing that I say, a new thought is happening. And I thought that would be perfect for a mind map. Um, so why else, what are there some other reasons, are reasons you might choose software? Pre-existing knowledge. If there was something where I could take the open office stuff that I have and just export it to a mind map, that would have been great, right? Because I already have the knowledge. I've already made the presentation in um, open office. So it'd be great if I could do that. Um, what else? Values, right? Does it align with your values? I didn't want to pay $100 for a piece of software if I didn't know if I was going to use it or not, right? Um, I also like went through the hassle of downloading something from something that must have had a really slow website because it was like 100 megs and it took 30 minutes to download. Um, and everything else was really fast. And I finally opened it and it was like, to use this, sign in because of the cloud. And I was like, I don't want it to be in the cloud. It says there's a desktop version. Why do I have to sign up or sign in? And I didn't bother using that piece of software. Um, and if there wasn't a free trial, I was like, forget it. Um, but I mean, it just if there wasn't a way for me to find out, I'm not going to pay $100 sight unseen for software if I've never used it. Those were my values for, for doing it. Um, also, open source. I didn't really care if it was open source or not in, in this particular thing, but some people really care. Some people, you know, will have uh, take their PC laptop and put Ubuntu on it because they it's their value and it's very important to them that their database, their, their operating system is open source. Um, all of the software that we're going to talk about today is open source. Drizzle, MariaDB, Percona, and Oracle, Oracle's version of MySQL are all open source. Um, but you might care if something's open core versus open source. Um, and you might look at something like how many non-corporate contributors. Are they contributing to the community? Do they contribute to the ecosystem? Um, how easy is it for me to patch something? How easy is it for me to get my patch into the software so everyone can use it? How easy is it for me to get a fix if I have a problem? Right? These are all really, really important values. And before you pick a piece of software, you know, even though all of these, you know, all of the, if you just have a blog, for example, all of the software that I'm going to talk about today would work for you. Heck, SQLite would work for you. If you just, if all you have is a blog and it's not very popular, you don't need a thousand concurrency or whatever, because it's just you writing on it. Um, you could probably just do it in text files, right? But there are certain principles that you have. So it's not just technical merit as much as we'd like to think it is. Um, and also, are you going to have vendor lock-in? You know, are you going to start using one thing and then not be able to switch to something else? That's really important for some people. For other people, all they care about is it does what it does and it does it well, and that's, you know, it's completely technical merit and they don't care about vendor lock-in. Um, some people, it's, it's different. You know, it depends, right? Maybe they don't care about vendor lock-in if it's really easy to, to get a patch and there's a lot of um, stuff happening in the ecosystem, there's a lot of tools around it, right? So maybe you might care about vendor lock-in if there isn't a lot of stuff out there to use with it because then you might be stuck. Um, integration with your current environment, that's a big one. Again, like I said, if I wanted to, if I could download something that just exported from a presentation I already had, that's a win for me. If you're choosing database software, you might care about integration with your environment, whether it's your current environment or a future environment, right? You might be thinking ahead and say, well, I don't want something that's not going to work with Memcached, or maybe you're looking at something that has, you know, MariaDB has a Cassandra plugin, and you're like, well, we already use Cassandra, so maybe we'll use that because we know we're going to integrate them in the future. Um, the ecosystem around the software, and what do I mean when I say the ecosystem? I mean like the tools you can use. What are the third-party tools that you can use with them? Are people contributing them? Is it all from the vendor or all the tools from the vendor? Then if the vendor goes out of business or decides to stop working on it, you know, what happens? Where are the tools to work with that system? Um, also the technical support available, whether it's directly from 
you know, the organization or people that are coding, or if it's, you know, community support. What kind of technical support do you have out there? If you have a problem with X software, can you get help? And how can you get help? Um, and community support. So I'm going to talk about Drizzle, Oracle, Percona, and MariaDB. And I think it's actually in that order. I'm going to start with Drizzle. And I'm starting with Drizzle. Don't tweet this yet. Because Drizzle is homeopathic MySQL. Let me explain what homeopathy is. And I have a bias against it, just to let you know. So if anyone has a bias for it, forgive me. Homeopathy is where they take something like, um, let's say uh, you want to be inured against mercury poisoning. So you take some mercury, and then you dilute it like beyond all possible recognition. And then you, know, you drink it, or you topically apply it, or whatever. And basically, it's kind of like you waved the thing over water, and now it's homeopathic. Um, and so Drizzle's homeopathic MySQL, and let me explain it to you before you tweet that out, and I'll give you something you tweet a little bit later. Um, so from the Drizzle website at drizzle.org, Drizzle is based on a microkernel design that aims to be as pluggable as possible. So what Drizzle did is they took MySQL, I think it was 5.1 at the time, they stripped it down and said, we're going to take everything that is not completely necessary for querying out, including things like logging and authentication, right? So you download... Um, Drizzle, and if you want authentication, and when I say if you want authentication, I mean if you don't just want everyone to be able to log into the database, because that's how it works by default, you have to download a plugin. So the idea is the functionality you want, you add in. Hence, microkernel. It's a very small kernel. And so this is what I mean when it's homeopathic. Like they stripped down everything out of MySQL and then kind of put it back in in plugins and then rewrote it. Um, the documentation is a Creative Commons share alike 3.0 version, which means that if you added on to it, you could then copy the documentation, add your things you added on to it, which is um, very useful. Oracle's MySQL doesn't have that, and that's actually problematic when you get into forking it, because if you fork it, you can't actually fork the documentation, and then you get this split brain thing where you have to go to two places to see the documentation. Um, the docs are HTML only. I haven't seen a way to easily like download a PDF of all the documentation, which you know, can be a problem because you know, websites go offline sometimes. Um, the code is on Launchpad, so it's you know, free, open source, easy to get, all that kind of stuff. And it also uses BZR. Um, Drizzle licensing is GPL v2 because they forked MySQL. MySQL is GPL v2. But um, there are BSD licenses for things like protocol drivers and their replication messaging system. So some of their new stuff is BSD because they wanted a more permissive license. But once something is GPL v2, they can't just take it and say, OK, let me make it um, more broad. Um, so if you go to this web page, you would see a lot of these differences. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the differences because, again, this goes on the whole technical merit thing. So there's no time zones. It's all in UTC, which is great because MySQL by default uses whatever your system time zone is. So if you set your system time zone to Pacific time or Eastern time, that's what MySQL is going to be default. Um, there's no embedded server. MySQL actually has an embedded option. Um, there's no Windows version. Okay, they don't want to code a Windows version, fine. Um, but that's now changing who your audience is, right? So for Oracle, Windows is the most downloaded version of MySQL. Why? Because developers want a system on their laptop. Most of the laptops are Windows. So like, if you go by sheer number of downloads, Windows is the biggest platform for MySQL. Not so with Drizzle, because there is no Drizzle on Windows. Um, there's no system database in Drizzle. So all those MySQL tables, if you had any. Um, there's no store procedures in Drizzle. And there's no triggers and no views. Well, why do they not have those? And this is start, this, now you start seeing some of the culture of Drizzle and st some of the ideas behind Drizzle, including things like, we're not developing for Windows, right? So they say, why can't you have store procedures? Fundamentally, store procedures usually are not the correct architectural decision for applications that need to scale. OK, I see this, and I'm like, well, I mean, why, right? Well, and they say, because pushing more computation down into the database, which is the trickiest layer to scale, isn't a good idea. And to me, they could be right completely. Like, I don't know if the database is the trickiest layer to scale. It depends what kind of database system you're using and depends what you're trying to scale. If you're trying to scale reads on MySQL, it's really easy to do. So if your store procedures are all reads, then you know maybe it's not such a, a big thing. And this kind of blanket statement kind of gets you to understand the developers' mentalities, right? They're, they're kind of making these blanket statements. No windows, no store procedures, and here's why. Um, and maybe you agree with them, and you love it, and maybe you don't. Either way, um, if you look at this and you're like, wow, I would never want to use software made by someone who said that, 
then maybe drizzle's not for you. If you look at it and you're like, yes, right on, then maybe drizzle's for you. Um, so this is what I mean when I say things like, it's not just the technical merit. You know, it's, it's the whole culture around it and the attitude of the people working on it. Um, in Drizzle, like I said, everything's a plugin. So logging is a plugin. Whether it's general logs, error logs. I mean, these are stuff that you probably just want in the database, right? But let's say you don't, you can make it fast and lean, right? Maybe you don't care about logs on, on your, you know, on your blog or your, feed, your Twitter aggregator. Um, authentication is a plugin. Replication is a plugin. You know, replication is one of the biggest features in MySQL that makes it really, really scalable and really reusable. And yet, you know, it's a plugin in Drizzle. So compatibility in general, there, there is general compatibility between Drizzle and MySQL. Drizzle uses the ANSI 92 standard and cuts some stuff out that's not in there. The information schema is all ANSI, so anything that's in the information schema database is, is what's in the ANSI specification. If it's not in the ANSI specification, it's in the data dictionary database, right? So we know that we have an information schema table, and that's where a lot of metadata is. In Drizzle, some of that's in information schema, some of it's in data dictionary, so that you instantly know whether it's the standard or not, and whether it's portable or not. So it's trying to be able to, to, to make things more portable by doing that. My ISM exists, but for temporary tables only. EnoDB is the default storage engine for Drizzle which a lot of people may rejoice and cheer for, although MySQL got that in 5.5. Um, but Drizzle's had it all along. Um, there's no merge, no CSV, no archive, no federated storage engines. They just don't have it. They don't like it. They don't see a need for it. They don't include it. It's not even a plugin you can make. You can download. You could probably make it, patch it if you wanted. Some other, so some of the gotchas. Again, we're still on the same web page. I love this. Dash lowercase p and dash capital P are switched. So the reason they do this is to remove confusion. <laughs> now, I understand that MySQL got it backwards, right? Dash capital P and most things are passwords and dash lowercase p are ports. However, if you've been using MySQL, you're used to it, right? It's not confusing for you anymore. You figured it out once, you got it, right? Because if you put your password as the port and your port as the password, you didn't connect to MySQL. You didn't understand why. You saw that it wasn't doing, reading the passport, password right. You banged your head against the wall. Maybe you Google searched. Maybe you asked a colleague. You figured it out in about five minutes, right? So, you know, this is kind of like the whole, like, no, we're going to do it right. And again, if you love that attitude, Drizzle's for you. If you hate that attitude, Drizzle's not for you. Uh, there's no unsigned. So your integers, your numbers, they're all signed um, because that's the ANSI SQL standard. There's no full text search. Why is there no full text search? Use Sphinx, Lucene, or Solar. Which again, I mean, that's what most people recommend anyway, but if you need something small, why not have a plugin? I guess I could write one, patches accepted. Uh, there's no set, just use enumerated lists. Again, you know, not very many people use set. Enum is actually pretty useful, but if you want a set, which is more than one thing, you can't really do that in Enum. You would have to use bits and it would get complicated. Uh, there's no time, use either date, time, or int. So if you want a time like hours, minutes, seconds, you can't. You either have to use a date time, so zero days and hours and minutes, or an int. I don't know that many people using time that aren't just using seconds and int anyway. So again, not a big deal. Um, one of the things that Drizzle did um, was you know, talk to DBAs and said, what do people use, what do people not use? So some of this is coming from that. Um, there's int and big int only. Forget tiny int, forget you ever heard of tiny int. Forget you ever heard of medium int, right? Int and big int. You got 32-bit, you got 64-bit. That's all you need. No confusion, no fuss, no must, no unsigned, right? So now it works with things like Java, so you don't get this like buffer overflow. I don't know about other languages, but if you use an unsigned int um, with like Java, it can't handle it because in Java, a 32-bit thing is signed. So if you start to go into the unsigned range, um, Java just like, I don't know what this is, it's too big. And there's only blobs or text. There's no tiny text, no tiny blob, no long blob, just blob or text. That's it. There's no spatial data types. Why? Ah, oh, just go use Postgres. <laughs> Which, frankly, is what we tell people anyway, right? It's not really good. Spatial stuff isn't really good in MySQL. So if you really need that, consider using Postgres. But you know, maybe you're a MySQL DBA and you have like one table that needs to be geographic and you don't want to learn Postgres. So again, you know, you're probably not using the spatial data types, so who cares? Uh, no year data type, which is either a two or a four digit year. 
I don't know many people, it's like time, not really many people use it. And you can just use a tiny int. Oh, you can't use a tiny int in Drizzle. So you'd have to use an int, but anyway. Um, so what are Drizzle's values, right? We talked a little about values, whatever. There, there's a lot of choice, right? You choose what you add in, um, except when there is none because they were like, well, you don't need that. Go use something else for that. Um, and, you know, there is some integration, pre-existing knowledge. If you know how to query, you can do stuff. But there's a lot of stuff that's not in there. So a lot of your preconceptions, you know, that you can use things like tinyint and stuff, those you don't have to worry about anymore. So you can definitely use your pre-existing knowledge, um, but there's, there are differences. Um, and it's not a drop-in MySQL replacement. Drop-in replacement means shut down MySQL, install new package, turn it on, and you're fine. That's a drop-in replacement. Literally, you drop it into the binaries and you're fine. Drizzle is not a drop-in MySQL replacement. Um, that doesn't mean it's not good, but I mean, it's not even compatible with like MySQL dump. If you do a MySQL dump and try to import it into Drizzle, if you have like a tiny and data type, it's not going to work. So it could be a drop in MySQL replacement if you change all the stuff that doesn't work with MySQL. And it's still not a drop in, it's a MySQL dump. So in Drizzle, contributors span several companies. This is actually really important to some people that they're accepting patches from community and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's very community patch friendly. Drizzle's not forwards compatible, so if you're in Drizzle and you want to go to like MySQL or something like that, it can be difficult, you know, because of some of the limitations. Um, and it's not backwards compatible, as we were talking about. And uh, so it's pretty much vendor lock-in, right? You probably can go forward because there's more limitations in Drizzle, um, but it's not going to work the same. So if you only ever learn Drizzle, MySQL will be a completely different picture. Um, but then again, so is SQLite, and that doesn't stop millions of people from using SQLite. So vendor lock-in isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, you just have to know that if you go with this database and you want to convert it to another database, there's going to be, you know, a little bit of pain. So when I said Drizzle is homeopathic MySQL, um, I do want us to amend that by saying it's actually effective, whereas I don't think homeopathy is effective. So that, you tweet that. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of like if you want something between SQLite and MySQL, right, that's not as bloaty as MySQL and you can choose which plugins you want, then, you know, Drizzle is probably for you and that can't be embedded because Drizzle doesn't have embedded. So if you need embedded, you have to either use SQLite or MySQL. So any questions or feedback on Drizzle? How does it perform? Yeah. Pretty fast. I don't really have any benchmarks between the two because they're different systems, right? Um, I mean, it's fast. It's, it's supposed to be faster and more lightweight than MySQL because you're not having to worry about like, oh, is there a store procedure here? Is there, you know, is there, is there authentication if there is none? You know, if you don't have any authentication, it can go really fast. It never has to check any permissions. Right? So the answer is it depends. And I hate to give that answer, but yeah, it's, the, the answer is it's written to be faster than MySQL because you choose what you use. So the question is, is it a continual fork? Like if like this was based on MySQL 5.1, so do they do one based on MySQL 5.5, or do they fork it once and they're still on that path? They forked it once and they're still on that path. So there are things in 5.5 and 5.6 that were never stripped out and put back in or even considered because Drizzle is now its own thing. So that's the reason I did Drizzle first, actually, is because it's kind of not in the same space as the other ones, but you can't really talk about MySQL forks without talking about Drizzle because it's a true MySQL fork. All right. Let's talk about Oracle's MySQL. So Oracle has the original code base and license. So a brief history timeline. Once upon a time, MySQL AB, um, which is basically MySQL Inc., uh, existed. Um, then Sun bought them, and then Oracle bought Sun. So Oracle now owns MySQL. Woohoo! Um, is Oracle going to kill MySQL? Glad you asked. Uh, Oracle won't kill MySQL, and here's how you know. In 2009 was when Oracle bought Sun. In 2006, Oracle bought EnoDB, bought EnoBaseOi. So Oracle owned EnoDB before Percona Server, before MariaDB was even a company. Like, Oracle could have killed MySQL back then. And actually, MySQL got a little worried when Oracle bought them and started to develop a transactional storage engine called Falcon. That never happened. And you know, then um, MySQL became part of Oracle anyway. So now MySQL and EnoDB can play happy together. But for a while, there was, you know, people were worried. So people thought the sky was going to fall when Oracle bought EnoDB because they were like, oh, God, if EnoDB closes it or makes you pay $100,000 for EnoDB, we don't have a transactional storage engine. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. OK, and guess what else? MySQL still open. So if Oracle wanted to kill MySQL, they would have done so in 2006 when they actually could do it. If they killed MySQL now, they just stopped developing it tomorrow and were like, you know what? 
fair enough forks and stuff. MySQL would still live on, so we as the users wouldn't be screwed. We would just use either the Bacona patch set or MariaDB. Oracle, however, is not an open source company. So that all being said, um, they're not an open source company. They don't do things in an open source way. Um, they do a lot of things that are bad moves, that seem to be bad moves. Um, like it looks like my, that Oracle's closing MySQL, um, but if you look at them a little closer, it's more that they're just integration with how they do things. For example, the bugs database. So the bugs database in MySQL is always open. You go to bugs.mysql.com and everything is there. All the bugs that the developers find, all the internal stuff, that's all in bugs.mysql.com. If there was a security one um, that you know, they didn't want to get out, they would lock it down, but for the most part, everything was visible and everything was in that system. Oracle bought MySQL, and now a lot of stuff is in Oracle's bug system, which, by the way, closed. So all of a sudden, you start going from seeing a couple dozen new bugs a week in bugs.mysql.com to a handful of bugs a week, and you say, well, what happened? Well, what happened was the developers were told to go to use the internal system, the internal bug system that every company at Oracle uses. Oracle buys companies. It's one of the things they do. They have, they have dozens of different companies they bought. Sun slash MySQL was only one of them. And Sun obviously had a lot of properties as well. Um, security bugs, people you know, claim that Oracle's hiding security bugs. MySQL did that too. So you know, yeah, is that really the best way to go? We, we can argue that, hey, if you put the security exploits out there, they'll get fixed faster. Whereas a lot of companies, like if you put these security exploits out there, you're giving the criminals something to exploit. And you're like, dude, the criminals already know it, right? The point is, if you don't make the exploits public, it's not like the criminals won't have the exploits, right? They'll get it. Has anyone here heard that uh, Fedora decided to drop Oracle's MySQL and are now going with, um, I think it's MariaDB? Yeah, MariaDB. One of the main reasons they cited for that was that um, Oracle wasn't giving away test cases, which is bizarre because Oracle is giving away the test cases. They're just doing it under a different license. So they're not giving it away publicly, but they specifically are giving it away to distributions. So I think Fedora wanted to do it as just a, uh, a values thing. I think they were just like, look, Oracle's not an open source company. We don't feel comfortable. Let's go with MariaDB. They're an open source company, which is fine, except that that's not what they said. What they said was, we're not going with Oracle because X, Y, and Z, which actually isn't true. So it's a little weird. I mean, it would be perfectly fine for them to say, look, Oracle's not an open source company. It's weird in the way that they made the decision, but I, you know, I think underneath they, were, they just wanted to not use Oracle, which is perfectly reasonable. And again, you might say, look, Oracle's not an open source company. I'm not comfortable using them. I want to use something else. Values. It has nothing to say about the technical merit, right? So what is the code base, right? It's dual licensed. What does that mean? There's two different licenses you can have. One is GPL v2. So when you download the free version, that's what you get. But what if you want to embed MySQL in your product and then sell your product and not give all the code away from your product? You can actually buy your way out of the GPL v2. You can buy an embedded license. So if you pay money, you can use MySQL embedded in your system without having to actually GPL your code, right? If you add code onto, it, onto MySQL, you have to GPL your code. So it, there's actually two different licenses. So it's GPL v2, except when it's not. And here's the weird thing, documentation, MySQL's documentation, the, the big manual online, whatever, is actually a regular copyright. So you can download MySQL and redistribute it, but you can't download the documentation and redistribute it. I mean, that actually was something that MySQL AB did a long time ago. So that's not something that Sun or Oracle did. When Sun bought it, we were trying to get them to change the license, and Sun refused to change the license, and I think that nobody's actually asked Oracle yet. The thing about Oracle is, so, you know, the MySQL community, very, very awesome. You go to planet.mysql.com. A, there's a blog aggregation of all of, like, you know, the bloggers that blog about MySQL. And that's pretty much like if something was wrong, somebody would blog about it and somebody else would be like, yeah, right on, blog about it and stuff like that. And the people who were developing MySQL, Red Planet MySQL, and so did that. That's not how Oracle works. Because Oracle owns so many companies, they'd have to read so many blog posts. It would be people's like full-time job just to read blog posts. So what they do is they do it by having committees, right? So there's actually a MySQL council. They meet every month on the odd months. They talk amongst themselves. And then the even months, they talk with an Oracle rep so that they get things like, hey, we need a conference, right? Oracle needs to put on a conference because, you know, this is the most popular open source database. So, you know, we've done things like we've, I'm actually on the council, They've, we've actually asked putting back stuff into the regular bugs database. So, um, you know, again, Oracle is not an open source company and they buy a lot of companies and they just, they follow their processes when merging. 
Uh, I, I will say all the stuff that I have seen where people are like, this is horrible, Oracle's closing MySQL, it's all been really like they're merging in with their own processes. Now, that being said, you might still say, well, who knows what they'll merge. I, I still don't want to use them. That's perfectly okay. You know, I'm, I'm trying to defend Oracle here because I think there's a lot of Oracle bashing and I'm trying to give a, a, a balanced view. Um, and so you'll see with like Bracona and, and MariaDB, I kind of show the good and the bad as well. I don't think I need to show the bad about Oracle because I think we probably all know all of it. So here's something interesting. Downloading doesn't require any information. You don't need to log in or anything like that to, to download either the software or the documentation. This may seem weird, but there are other stuff out there where you can't download, you can download the software but not the documentation. You know, community patches are welcome. There are monthly releases. It may take a while for them to accept your code. And Oracle actually has a pretty good commitment to MySQL, I think. MySQL 5.5 was criticized a lot because they had nothing new. Um, but previous versions of MySQL were criticized, like MySQL A, B, and Sun were criticized for never taking community patches. So 5.5 was criticized for taking only community patches. So uh, I don't know what to do anymore. Um, MySQL 5.6 has a lot new. And if you've heard a lot, of, a lot of things about MySQL 5.6, just remember that 5.6 is the first version that was 100% soup to nuts under Oracle. That's like when they started developing 5.6, you know, it was Oracle that was at the range that decided what was going to go in and what didn't go in. So whatever you like and hate about 5.6, that's truly what, you know, you could say Oracle did. So now I said there was no login requirement. When you go to download MySQL, um, this is what you get. Can you see, does this look like there's no login required? See this login or sign up? Yeah, it's down here. No thanks, just start my download. And I can't tell you how, like I download MySQL a bunch and I still forget that little thing is there. So as much as there's no login required. That, that was the same way with Sun. They did the same. Yeah. Sun, yes. It was with MySQL AB? Certainly wouldn't be hard for them to change that. So let's talk about integration with Oracle um, and pre-existing knowledge, right? Obviously, if you have MySQL and you're using Oracle, then you know, it all just works, right? That's kind of the standard. And it has a pretty good and, and large ecosystem. And in fact, um, the Percona and MariaDB ecosystem is very similar. Like a lot of the tools can be used on Oracle, Percona, or um, MariaDB. So Oracle actually does a conference called MySQL Connect. Um, there's one planned for 2013. You can go to that URL. It's a business conference. It's a technical conference. Stop, you're both right. Um, it's a business conference, a technical conference. If you want to learn things like the roadmap and stuff like that, that's the conference to go to. That's in September. It's right before Open World because they have all those rooms in San Francisco, so might as well just do something right before since they already have the staff all there and booked. But they also have something called Virtual Developer Days. And they did this last year. It was pretty cool. Um, and they're doing it again this year. They're actually doing it uh, next week or two weeks, March 12th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and there's a URL if you want to look at that. Um, I'll also make a blog post with all these links and you can download the slides. Or you can just um, Google search for Virtual Developer Day MySQL and you'll find it. Um, it's free and basically you get to hear like all the roadmaps and stuff like that. So you can actually learn it for free in March-ish or you could go to MySQL Connect and you know, pay money and, and learn it in September, right? So they, they basically are giving you access to hear directly from the developers twice a year. Um, and if you're in Europe, the Middle East, or Africa, it's March 19th, right, at 9 a.m. GMT, just because time zones are hard. Uh, any questions about Oracle's MySQL? Comments, feedback? I heard Oracle does X. What do you say about that? No? Okay. Did I do the good and the bad pretty well? Because I, I don't want it to sound like I love Oracle. They do great, they do great stuff, but they're not perfect. So, um, Percona. Per, this is from their website. Percona server is an enhanced... Drop and replace it for MySQL. Now, I bolded enhanced. Obviously, it's not just an exact copy of MySQL, right? So I think that's their way of trying to distinguish that Percona server is actually a patch set. It's not a fork. They haven't forked the code and are developing. It's patches applied to MySQL, which is good and bad. It's good because if MySQL has a new version, right, like we talked about with Drizzle, they forked and they're there. If, um, if MySQL, you know, when they go to 5.6, Percona hasn't released 5.6 yet. They probably will soon. Um, but it's a patch set, right? So they just apply the patches to the new stuff. So you get the features of the new version. On the other hand, if Oracle stops developing MySQL tomorrow, my guess is Percona will fork it, right? I mean, I don't think they'll still do it. But here, if you go with the Percona server, you get the benefit of two corporations, right? You get Percona and Oracle and whatever patches they all accept from the community. Right, so if one stops, you know, this is, this is very much like there's no vendor lock-in, right, because you can back, back and forth. 
Um, but it's still GPL v2, right? Because it's just patches on top. It's not even a fork. Um, and the documentation is still copyright Oracle, which is kind of annoying because if you want to know how something works, like for example, if you're upgrading from um, MySQL 5.1 to Percona 5.5, you might notice that all of a sudden all of your floats change. And I think they used to be in um, scientific notation and now they're not, which gets really hairy when you do checksums because a checksum of a number in scientific notation is different from a checksum of a regular number because it just does a checksum of like how it appears. So you actually get the checksum of like 1.0e5 as opposed to 10,000. That's actually something that changed in MySQL, not in Percona, but when you find a bug like that, you don't know if it's Percona or MySQL. You have to look in two places. Um, Percona, so the Percona documentation is also kind of a patch, right? So um, interestingly enough, Percona software, you can download either from a you know, Yum repo or Debian repo. They have repos, and they also have the website. Those you can download for free. The downloading the documentation requires a login. Well, not a login. They want, to give you, they want you to give them your email address. Um, and they do sign you up for their newsletters and stuff. Downloading software doesn't. Hmm, whatever. And certainly browsing the documentation online, there's no login or, or user information needed. But it was kind of weird when I saw that. I'm like, oh, look, I can download the PDF. Oh, I have to give my information? Yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, Percona is, however, they're committed to open source. They're an open source company. They're committed to the ecosystem. They've uh, done a lot of toolkits. The Percona toolkit is something that most people can't live without, including myself. Um, I use PT Table Checksum. I use... Uh, I've used uh, PT slave restart. Some people use PT slave delay to make delayed slaves. Um, and certainly, Percona extra backup is the way to do backups. Sorry, raw slash physical backups free. There's no other tool that does that. Percona also has monitoring plugins. Um, they have an EWB data recovery tool. They have Percona playback, which can play back, back logs. And they have benchmarking tools. So they're not just committed to making um, their server, which they actually have in uh, an enhanced version of EnoDB called ExtraDB, which is why it's called Extra Backup, because it backs up ExtraDB and also EnoDB. But they have a lot of tools, right? So they're not only contributing to the server itself, they're contributing to the ecosystem around it. So they're, they're invested in MySQL. Um, so what's the difference, technically speaking? Well, you can go here, but I'll give you a brief overview. 23 extra information schema tables, so more stuff there. 60 extra performance or status counters. So when you do like show status, there's 60 more things. Well, they have some per table ones. They have per index ones, per client ones, per thread ones, and per user ones. Right? This is not in MySQL. This is only in the Percona patch MySQL. Talking about 5.5. Um, the reason that I'm not talking about 5.6, which I'll show you in another slide, is that Percona 5.6 hasn't come out yet, so there's no way to do a comparison. This, when we talk about MariaDB, I'll talk about 5.5 and 5.6. Percona 5.5 also has visible EnoDB data statistics, so you can't actually see like the EnoDB's metadata in MySQL, some of it, um, and some of it Percona opens up. Um, the EnoDB data dictionary and information schema, so you can actually see that, which is useful if you ever have problems with the data dictionary. The replication state is transactional, which is, actually comes in MySQL 5.6, but isn't in 5.5, and it's in Percona 5.5. The process list shows microseconds and has a couple other features as well. Microseconds has been very important to some very small minority of vocal people. I don't know about you, but most of my problems have not been in the microsecond range. They've been in like the this query takes 60 seconds or we have 5,000 queries taking five seconds each. But there are some people, you know, if you're like Facebook or Twitter, you care about um, microseconds. Um, there's better mutual exclusion diagnostics. Um, in MySQL 5.5, all you have is like show engine mutex status, which just shows you what's locking what. Doesn't really show you a lot of diagnostics about it, just kind of gives you status. There's finer grained mutex locking, so hopefully you won't have as many problems with locking because things will lock on a finer uh, resolution. There's visible undo segment information. I'm not going to go too much into undo logs versus redo logs, but it has to do with transactions. So you can actually see some of the stuff in the undo, log, in the undo segments. Um, and it has a buffer pool preload and a, and a faster shutdown. So this is something that is very important to people, faster shutdown. Um, and also buffer pool preload means that you can shut down Percona server and start it back up again. You don't have to worry about the you know, to be buffer pool cache reloading, right? It's not going to be cold cache. It's going to be pre-warmed. And you basically it can export it and import it. Um, so that's a huge, huge benefit, um, which is now in 5.6, I think, too. Um, there's a self-tuning checkpoint algorithm, so it self-tunes and you know makes it better and it's kind of adaptive. There's partitioned adaptive hash search. So MySQL has adaptive hash search, which 
without getting too complicated in the internals, it's just talking about kind of um, how indexes self-tune, I guess you could say. Um, and so they partition it so it's faster to do that kind of thing. Um, drop table happens in the background. Now, why is this important? If you drop a table, what it does underlying is it like does a, an RM of the table, it deletes the table. If you have a 10 gigabyte table, the disk is going to take a long time to finish deleting that table. And in MySQL 5.5, you have to wait. In Percona 5.5, it just does it in the background. And there are read ahead improvements. Um, so if you're doing anything that requires a read ahead, there's improvements in 5.5, so those queries happen faster. Now, all of these things, you know, I hate to be like all these technical, throwing out all this jargon, but the problem is, is that is Percona faster? Well, it's faster if you use any of this stuff, right? So it's hard to say, you know, again, it depends. Is it faster, is it not? It should be faster. For something like Percona Server 5.1, it was almost always faster because it just had more read threads and more write threads by default, right? MySQL had one read thread, one write thread for NodeDB, and by default, Percona Server had four so of each. So it was just faster by default. There aren't any of these magic kind of faster things in Percona 5.5 that I could, you know, grok out. Um, there's a per table import even with EnoDB. So with EnoDB, you can't just like import one table unless you're doing MySQL dump. Right? If you're using physical files, you can't just copy the IBD over like you can with my ISM files. Um, Percona Server actually lets you do that. How do you do it? You do it with extra backup export and you specifically export a table. And what it does is it'll export the table and then also the data dictionary information about that table. Um, there's a configurable data dictionary size. Again, most people, it doesn't really matter, but if you're particularly big or particularly small and you want to change it, um, it's useful to be able to configure it. Configurable insert buffer size. This is starting to get into crazy internals that, you, you know, if, you're, if you've ever sat there going, gosh, I wish my insert buffer, I wish I could configure it to be bigger, then you probably know more than I do about my SQL internals. Um, configurable fast index creation, so you can say, oh, make the indexes quicker or not. There are trade-offs, um, but at least you have the choice. And there are error and warning log enhancements. One of the things about the Percona patch set that I really like is that by default, it works how MySQL works. So by default, it's, it's forwards and backwards compatible. And it's only if you specifically change stuff um, that you make it not forwards and backwards compatible. That being said, why would you use Percona server if, without actually changing anything, right? Wouldn't the point be to use that? Now, you know, I laugh, but, you know, maybe it's an ecosystem thing. Maybe it's a values thing. Maybe. Um, so Percona is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. You can shut down MySQL, remove the packages, install Percona, and start it up, and it will work. Drop in replacement. You can drop MySQL back in. If you want to do this experiment, shut down MySQL, remove the packages, install Percona server, start MySQL, you know, start Percona's MySQL, it'll work, replication will work, all this kind of stuff. Shut down, My, shut down Percona server, remove the packages, install MySQL, it'll work. It's all forwards and backwards compatible, but if you're, that's only if you're not using Percona features. Right? If you start using it, if you convert the tables to, um, to extra DB, for example, you're not going to have to convert them back. So you can actually do that with MySQL dump. So if you're worried about something like vendor lock-in or whatever, um, you're supposed to actually use MySQL dump for major upgrades. So when you upgrade from 5.1 to 5.5, you're not supposed to just shut down MySQL 5.1, install MySQL 5.5. You're supposed to do a MySQL dump anyway. And I've used MySQL dump very effectively. You know, at Mozilla, we had stuff on MySQL 5.0. We went to Percona 5.1. Now we're at Maria 5.5. We're looking to see who comes up with the best 5.6, and we'll use that. And all of this is done with MySQL dump. So you can go really easily back and forth between, you know, Maria, Percona, and MySQL, Oracle's MySQL, if you're just using MySQL dump. Now, the cool part is with, you don't have to do that for every server. Let's say you have a master and four slaves. You take one slave, you upgrade it, you do the MySQL dump or whatever, or you know, change over to a new server, and then you can use Percona's extra backup to actually copy you know, from one slave to all the rest. So you really only have to do it once per kind of cluster. So it's not that much of a big deal. Question? Yeah, so you're saying, can you just do the drop-in replacement and do MySQL underscore upgrade and it will upgrade the tables? Yeah, you can do that, but if you upgrade tables such that they are using Percona features, so if you change stuff around in, in the configuration, whatever, and then you convert a table to extra D, for example, it won't be backwards compatible. Not as a drop-in replacement, but you can still do MySQL dump because MySQL dump does a logical backup and it does SQL statements. And so as of right now, anyway, Percona doesn't change any SQL statements, so you're fine. Um, so again, since, you have to, since you're supposed to use MySQL dump, for major upgrades, right, so from a major version, so 5.1 to 5.5 or 5.5 to 5.6, then it's not, it shouldn't be a change of behavior if you had to switch between these.
That's my opinion. Your opinion might be if it's not a drop in replacement, forget it. Um, Percona 5.6 versus my SPL 5.6, there's no comparison yet. Why not? Uh, there's no Percona release yet. But uh, likely there will be one at the end of April because there's a big conference at the end of April that Percona is running, Percona Live um, MySQL Conference and Expo in Santa Clara, and um, there's a Percona 5.6 talk. So pretty sure that by then they'll probably do what most people do and take the first day of the conference and announce the big release. So look for that. And I'm sure that they'll have a performance comparison and a feature comparison benchmarks and all that kind of stuff because Percona is really good like that. Um, Percona has a really good blog called MySQL Performance Blog, um, and they do a lot of really cool, like, internal, deep down, heavy, benchmarky things. Um, they really know their stuff. So Percona Live. So we talked about MySQL Connect. Let's talk about Percona Live. They do them in different cities, like they've done them in London, they do them in New York City, and they do a big conference in April, kind of taking over the, uh, the O'Reilly when O'Reilly stopped doing it. It's a business conference. It's also a technical conference. Um, and unfortunately, Percona blocked a conference involving all the players. Um, you know, political backstory, blah, blah, blah. You can, like, you know, look it up. But basically, um, like, SkySquill, Oracle, Monty, Program, Togutech all got together um, and, and, you know, involved Percona. We're like, we want to do a conference because O'Reilly's not doing it anymore. Let's do a conference. Um, and, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. Percona never responded. Um, and about, you know, six weeks after they were initially asked, um, Percona was like, hey, guess what? Since O'Reilly abandoned the conference, we're going to step in and save the day and do this conference because we didn't hear about anyone else who was doing a conference which is put a little people, a few people on edge because there were other people doing a conference and they did know about it and, and the committee actually realized that Percona might be doing this. So it was like, well, let's wait and see what Percona says because we don't want to do a competing conference because we don't want to split the community. You know, you can look at the, look at the story at, at uh, this bit.ly um, and here's a quote from the, actual, um, from the actual press release they did about conference, which was emphasis on business. So there was some stuff before it. This is emphasis on business. We need a place where vendors, both open source and closed source, can showcase their products and services. This is the hand that feeds all of us. It's good for Percona's business, and it's good for everyone else's too. Okay, makes sense. But what if you took this statement and you changed one word? You changed Percona to Oracle. If Oracle said this, wouldn't you be like, wait, open and closed source? It's all about business? Really? So. You know, there's something going on there where, you know, their Percona is really good for the ecosystem. I don't know how good they are for the community. That makes any sense? Because their interests are business. So Percona's values are about Percona's business. Now, granted, Percona's business is MySQL. And so they're making tools. They're doing a lot of stuff. They have a consulting business. It's where they make most of their money. They also do training. Their business does benefit the community. But a lot of the decisions they make, like, for example, making a conference and not telling anyone until like they had all the deposits in whatever that's the right thing to do from a business perspective right it's kind of a douchey thing to do from a community perspective um so i wouldn't say that their that i would say that their business is not necessarily community friendly even though their software is extremely community friendly so any questions about percona feedback yes does percona submit their patches back to mysql not that i am aware of however they're all open source and gpl so Oracle developers can actually get them. But uh, MariaDB does, and I'll talk about that. So there's, there's two levels there, right? One, it's, it's GPL, anyone can use it, and you know, they didn't try to sue anyone, I guess. I don't know if we're using it. But the, the other, like one level up would be like, here, I made this patch, we think you might be interested in it. And actually, MariaDB does that, and that's really kind of really good of them, right? Any other questions or feedback about Percona? So MariaDB was made by Monty Program. Monty program is Monty Videnius, who was one of the original founders of, of MySQL. Um, he was not very happy about the Oracle acquisition. Enough said about that. Um, MariaDB, very committed to open source. It's an open source company, right? It's a true fork of MySQL, not a patch. If Oracle stops developing MySQL tomorrow, there's still going to be new versions of MariaDB. MariaDB is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. It's future compatible using MySQL dump, as we've said before. Um, I'm unsure of forward compatibility, and we'll get into the reasons of that in a, little, in, in a little while when we talk about the technical differences. But they're, they're doing a lot of funky things. Some of them are how, um, are how things are used differently. They've also got different ways of querying and things like that. So with Percona, things are just faster, and you, you, know, you can use regular um, queries that would work in MySQL. In MariaDB, you start to get things like dynamic columns and things like that, that you know, the data isn't necessarily going to work in, if you try to port it back to MySQL even using MySQL dump. 
MariaDB merges back with Oracle monthly. So every month, Oracle releases a version, and MariaDB looks at it and be like, okay, what do we want to take from that? Um, and MariaDB also sends their patches to Oracle, which frankly I think is a really good community steward, right? They're like, here, we think this is really good. We'd like to send it to you. And they specifically send it to them. Whether Oracle chooses to include them or not is not Oracle's decision. But there's no way they could say we had no idea about that. We didn't bother to go look in the source code, blah, blah, blah. I think that's good. Let's talk about versions. MySQL version 5.1 is MariaDB version 5.1. And MariaDB version 5.2. And MariaDB version 5.3. Why all these versions? Well, MariaDB version 5.1 is based on MySQL 5.1. What about MariaDB 5.2? Well, it's also based on um, MariaDB 5.1, but it's got the features that didn't have time to go into 5.1. Um, MariaDB 5.3 has everything 5.2 does, but it also radically improves subqueries, joins, single table large data set query performance. So better performance for large tables if you're doing a, a single table, better performance for joins, better performance for subqueries. Why would you get like 5.2 and not 5.3? I don't know. I don't know why they didn't make one version. Who knows? Um, what's MariaDB version 5.5? Anyone care to take a guess? Okay, it's actually MariaDB 5.3 plus MySQL 5.5. So MariaDB version 5.5 is not MySQL 5.5 plus patches, right? They took MariaDB 5.3 and then added the features of 5.5. Okay, it's a little complicated. So they have a fork and they're taking things and putting them back in. Instead of like actually, I said they merge back, they don't really merge back and then refork. MySQL 5.6 is analogous to MariaDB version 5.3. Any other guesses? 5.4, 5.6. How about 10? <laughs> MariaDB was like, we can't handle this, right? Because there was, there, luckily there was a gap between 5.1 and 5.5, so they took advantage of that. So they won 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. 5.5 doesn't have that gap, so they were just like, for 5.6, we're gonna go to 10. Okay, so they can have 10, 10, 1, 10, 2, but then how are you going to remember that 10 is 5, 6, and 11 is 5, 7, and version 20 is what now? Uh, presumably it's so they can have the multiple versions, 10, 10.1, 10 10.2, 10 but why not say make it MariaDB version 56, right? Now, me being the helpful sort, I actually tweeted this, and I'll read you these tweets. You won't be able to read them, so I'll read them to you. You know, hey, just saying, wouldn't it be more user-friendly if MariaDB used 5, 6, 56? And so someone wrote back, and I won't say his name because it's not important, um, not a MariaDB developer. So let's be clear. We said, perhaps easy administrative modification of the reported user number would be useful, somewhat, somewhat like modifying user agent. In other words, maybe it'd be great that you could change it, like maybe an easy variable for you to change. And I wrote back and I said, well, that's not built into MySQL, so you'd have to change source code. It'd be much easier for MariaDB to just change the version numbers to be more sensible. Maybe I shouldn't have said more sensible, but that's kind of how I feel. So then he wrote back and he said, well, it's pretty easy to change the code. Here's where you do it. Here's the, here's the bizarre.launchpad.net place to do it on the MariaDB side. All you need to do is recompile, right? Okay, you're laughing, good. That's what I was like, that's not the point. So I said, correct, so individually recompile or own MariaDB or MariaDB could make the change themselves and eliminate everybody else doing it. And you know, I, I said, I, I, haven't yet, I don't yet have a reason to use MariaDB 10, so it's, not, it's a moot point for me, but I was just trying to be helpful to MariaDB because they might lose customers who are like, what, Maria 11 is MySQL 5.7, what? So, MySQL 5.1 is MariaDB 5.1, 5.2, My MariaDB 5.5 is MySQL 5.5 plus MariaDB 5.3. MariaDB 10 is actually MariaDB 5.5 plus some MySQL features. So how the heck do you document this? Now, here's the fun part. It gets more confusing. I'm glad I, you guys are, are, are awake. So MariaDB 5.6 is MariaDB 5.5 plus some MySQL 5.6 features. It's kind of like a distribution, right? When Red Hat distributes MySQL, they don't put everything that's in MySQL 5.6. They pick and choose. Really a, kind of a pain in the butt. Like Ubuntu picks and chooses and they add things like an Etsy my.cnf.d directory, right? That's not in the MySQL code. So what's in MariaDB 10? So you can go to this URL to see. So you have things that were merged from MySQL 5.6, things that MariaDB 10 took from 5.6. You have things that were taken from 5.6 and then improved. You have things that are the same feature that's in MySQL 5.6, but they did it differently. Then you have things that were in 5.6, that in MySQL 5.6, that were merged from Maria 5. I don't know why this is a category on their website other than, look at what we did. We did it so well, Oracle used it. 
great, but I don't really see how that's applicable unless you have the documentation and MySQL doesn't. Where do you go for the documentation? Do you go to Maria for that? Do you go to Maria 5X? Was it 51, 52, 53, 55? What was it? I don't know. Do I go to the MySQL documentation? Uh, and then there's stuff that's only in Maria 10. So what's only in Maria 10? Multi-source replication. Woohoo! Multi-master replication for reals. Code is originally from Taobao, which they say on their website, so I threw it in there. Show explain, so you actually do a show on your explain. Uh, faster group commit, which basically uses better inter-thread communication. Separation of optimizer statistics and storage engines. Um, there's actually a Cassandra storage engine in MariaDB 10. Pretty cool. You can combine MariaDB and Cassandra. Um, basically, Cassandra can read from MariaDB, and MariaDB can write to Cassandra. So you use SQL, and you get the no SQL stuff, right? So you can do select, insert, update, delete, and it all gets propagated to Cassandra. Um, dynamic columns. So what's a dynamic column? Instead of saying, okay, this column is an int, you can use different sets of data for each row, even though it's the same column. So this is one of the reasons people go to no SQL is they want dynamic columns. Um, and then there's also dynamic columns in the Cassandra engine. Um, and there's also JSON rows. So a lot of people like to put JSON in the database. Now it's built in in, in MariaDB, in the dynamic columns. MariaDB 10 features. Also, per thread memory usage, based on another Taobao patch. Faster alter table if you have a unique key. Um, so, so that's everything that's new. What about what stuff they directly merged from 5.6 without changing? Well, most new information schema, I'm going to do this quickly because, again, where do you look for the documentation? 5.6? Maria? Hmm? Uh, and perf most performance schema tables. What's this most? Which ones? Um, order by limit optimization, loading multiple plugins with plugin load add. Um, is that it? That's all they say on their, their website. Is that it? Well, sort of. Um, there's the stuff that's merged from Maria 5 into 5.6. So that's in both, I guess. If you want to know what's in both, you have to go to like three different categories, right? So many optimizer features, and they do have a comparison matrix, so there's no quotes around the many. Microseconds, again, everyone loves microseconds. Bin log annotations, bin log group commit, just precise, thread pool, blah, 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 blah. So is that it? No. There's still the stuff that's backported from MySQL 5.6, but further developed by MariaDB. So it's like what's in 5.6, but they made it enhanced, which is just bin log checksums. Thankfully. And then there's the stuff that they did in 5.6 in parallel with Oracle's 5.6, but they did it differently. So the same features in 5.6 and 10, but they're implemented differently and might work differently. Um, full auto initialized timestamp date support. So when you have a timestamp in a table, I think now you can do two in one table, more than one in a table. That kind of stuff, you can do it for date time. That's full support for that is in both, but they work differently. Um, and there will be more with more versions. Things like 10.0, 10.1, 10.2, et cetera, right? So this is why they're kind of going to 10, because my guess is they're going to re-implement a lot of stuff. Some of the stuff they merge back, some of the stuff they don't. Like there were some optimizer features that they had done in parallel, and they realized that Oracle stuff was better, so they ripped theirs out, put Oracle's in. They're starting to have stuff that Oracle didn't do better, so they're leaving that in. So that's MariaDB. Are there any questions, suggestions, whatever about MariaDB? Given all the craziness, is there any reason to use it? Yes, if you have like really crazy subqueries and stuff, MariaDB is pretty awesome for subqueries. Pretty, pretty awesome. I mean, MySQL 5.6 is getting better, but MariaDB is still kind of ahead of the game when you come to that. If you want dynamic columns, if you're using Cassandra, you want to implement it. If you're worried about Oracle as, as a host for MySQL, they're, they're, you know, if you love Monty, you know, there's plenty of reasons to use MariaDB. If you have simple needs and you just want to use MySQL, use MySQL. Just like if you want to use SQLite, right? Use SQLite. It's not open, I don't, is it open source? Mm, I don't remember. You know, there, there are reasons other than, you know, on a technical merit standpoint, the reason to use it is subqueries and joins and stuff. Thank you.